good. Twenty one. This is podcast twenty one. Do you know some things about twenty one? This is sounding more like Devo. It's it's, it's um rolling in a deep by Adele. <laughs> I want to do some Anthony Kiedis oh. stuff over the top. Well, yeah, no, I've done with the Anthony Kiedis <laughs> thing. Right, hold on, I'll you, do you, you sent it to me too many times. I was like, oh. <laughs> anyway, do you know, this is, actual, this is Podcast 21. Was that our intro song? That's what that's going to oh, have to does. do. Sorry. The one time you actually get to see us. <laughs> 21 is the late age you're legally allowed to drink in the States. Mm-hmm. And then also, if you live in the US, you're only allowed to buy more than one ticket to an R-rated movie once you reach the age of 21. 21 is important in America. That rumour in, room, um, rumor in the Deep, roll, Rolling in the Deep, is from Adele's album called 21. Is she? That's what that's up to, yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah, it was, yeah. I didn't even know that. There you go. That was okay. pretty coincidence. I didn't plan that at all. We've had an evening. <clears throat> We've had a magic evening, actually. Well, it's been well, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're, you're offering a glimpse up the wizard's lead here. <laughs> <laughs> We're about to have an evening. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. We've reco- yeah. Uh, time travel. <laughs> yeah, we're about to have an evening. How do you introduce something that's already happened and pretend that it's about to happen? Because we definitely didn't forget to record the intro before we did it, did we? No. That's exactly what we um, didn't do. So, Incubus, talk to me about Incubus. Incubus um, is a Incubus are a band that uh, th- they were there in the day of early influence in my life. They were um, just, I was, you know, they were the band that you wanted to be the bass player in for me. I did along with Primus and the Chilies and all that sort of that forefront bass in your face sort of stuff. You know what I mean? Um, highly influential. I've listened to their first five albums. I can't even tell you how many times. Yeah, science. Oh, science. Science, science was just it's a, a landmark. My, was my favourite thing for a, you know, especially being a bass player who liked a bit of slap bass and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, it seemed equally of you. I know they were very influential for your very oh, yeah. for your first covers band. You oh yeah, do, you used to do a lot of their songs. We did. I loved it, and um, I mean. Dirk's bass playing because I think when I started when I started playing bass I bought Californication by the Red Hot Chili Peppers which was a huge influence on me I'm a bit older than you (laughs) (laughs) I think I bought Uplift Mofo Party Plan (laughs) damn I'm old (laughs) Um, and then this guy in my science class said I mean, if you know, if you like the Chilies, because I was banging on about them, I've been playing for bass like a week probably. You should listen to this band. He gave me a science CD, and then and then that was it. My mind was blown because I just it was it just it um opened up possibilities for bass playing that I didn't even know were possible, and I, and not just like how amazing a bass player here is uh, he is, but the way that he could fit that into this heavy guitar. I mean, yeah. people say Inquis were new metal. I never really thought they were new metal. Nah. But, um, but into that kind of heavy guitar kind of world, there was just still this bass line that you hit that was really cool and really interesting and really audible, I guess. I Unlike think... Fieldy from Corn, where you just couldn't bloody hear him. No, exactly. <laughs> and, and, but also, like, um, personality via musicality, for want of a better phrase. You mm. know what I mean? You know, it was, yeah. Like, those were the players I loved. Dirk was one of them. Because you could, you could have played in any band and he probably had he had such a distinctive style and such a personality, his own personality in his music that you could hear it. Yeah, Flea does uh, less. Claypool does obviously, and um, that's what I was drawn to. I think you know what I mean with all that. So um, we better flag with our the Zoom video recording didn't. It's like last every time we do a Zoom recording, something weird happens. I mean, there uh, were a few connection issues with with Dirk, but then he's in Hollywood, so. I think That's we right. can forgive that. But it didn't record our faces. I know. And I don't know why it didn't record our faces. It might be some it might be <laughs> so, something to do with so how make, our make faces. the most of this now. Because <laughs> you're not gonna it see might, it for the next hour. It might be something to do with the way our faces look. <laughs> yeah, maybe we've It might have just been gone, oh no, 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 no. no. <laughs> um so you're you're gonna hear both of us. Uh, you're gonna see Dirk in full, lovely, full screen. 
which is like, like I said to Carl earlier, at least it recorded him and not us. But our voices are going to be floating in from... Unless you're listening to the way we've done podcasts old school. Oh, this could be... Your, yeah, I mean, if you're on an audio yeah. podcast, then it makes means nothing to you at all. But I do suggest um, that if, you, if you're listening to this audio-wise... Um, Check out the video on YouTube. There'll be a link in the description, and yeah. you can you can see Dirk and all his all his um, handsome handsomely loveliness. Is that a word? Yes. Handsome, handsome, was... love, love, lovely handsomeness. <laughs> <laughs> help just... me, help me, Carl. No, I was just gonna, I was just gonna add to it. I was gonna say he's got a great beard. Yeah, got a really he's a good beard. Man. Yeah. And um, he's a good guy, he's a really good guy, and he talks a lot of sense, and he makes a lot of, and he, you know, what I mean, which is which is what we need nowadays, isn't it? The sense. <laughs> So by the power of the internet and by the power of wonderful harp noises, we are now going to take you ins- in to Dirk's face. <laughs> Do some better harp noises than that. <laughs> so like, can we take it right back to the beginning? That's right. I mean... Um... First the earth cooled and then a meteor hit. <laughs> oh. I mean, is that, what, what, yeah, that far back? Fast forward a few million years. <laughs> yeah. um, so, um, when so when you were younger, what kind of music was playing when you were home? I mean, what was what was the music? Was there much music going on in your household when you were a kid? Or, um, yeah, yes and no. My my dad is is partially deaf in one ear and almost completely deaf in the other. So his his listening to music was not really much of a thing. Um, but what he did listen to was was doo wop. You know, he's my dad's 80. So, you know, he grew up really with, with music in the fifties and sixties. Um, never any cool shit, mind you, <laughs> like edgy, but I, I did come to appreciate that music. And it's amazing what you can do sometimes with three chords and, and, you know, just melody and top line, if you will. Um, my mom was into music and her family was a little bit more musically inclined they um they were gospel people they're in the country so i I grew up listening to a fair amount of um willie nelson waylon jennings there was a good amount of music and a lot of it was country and and then sort of the tail end of disco because you know i was born in the mid 70s so it was an interesting sort of time for for music and like the first thing i remember sort of owning i owned a a record a disney put out a a disco version of some of their um you know songs that were associated with their cartoons so you know you'd have the donald duck singing disco versions of (laughs) you know macho man and 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 shit like that um and then once i got a little (laughs) bit older you know, Thriller came out and and had to have that. Um, and then it was, I would listen to the radio, mainly top 40 stuff. And, you know, there was a countdown show like that a lot of cities have, you know, every night slightly different positions. And I hit play and record on the radio and record the songs that I wanted to hear. And that was really my first intro, uh, introduction to music. And I don't know that I owned a lot of stuff. I started getting cassettes in the mid eighties, um, stuff that I would listen to on my own. And then in elementary school, started discovering things on the schoolyard, like Beastie Boys, yeah, Iron Maiden, cool. randomly, Red, Led Zeppelin, um, people who had older siblings and just music would start filtering down. So that was, that was kind of the beginning for me. That's so, cool. I was going to say, so, did that directly lead to your choice of instrument being the bass or is there been other? No, no, I, I can or... tell you exactly what led to me playing bass. It, it's incredibly simple story, but poignant in my life, <laughs> even right. if it is amusing. When I was in sixth grade, there was a talent show and my friends decided that they were going to be a band for the talent show and they were going to lip sync a white snake song like here I go again. And I wasn't asked to be in the band. I did lights and I was pissed. <laughs> and I, I said, you know, I didn't own an instrument. I played piano when I was a little bit younger than that. And I said, I'm going to learn how to play an instrument. And it just so happened that when I got into seventh grade and wanted to start doing that, 
I had a friend who already played drums. I had a friend who played guitar. I knew I could not sing. And I'm going to be honest, it's going to piss some people off. Playing piano in a rock band wasn't going to fucking, you know, <laughs> not that I was after the ladies at that point, but it just didn't seem cool enough. I'm like, that leaves me with a bass. <laughs> and so I, I think I started paying attention to the music that I was kind of into at that time. And I realized there was actually a lot of what was happening in bass that I, I genuinely liked. And I was into, at that point, I was into metal and, and rock. And the posters on my wall were like Appetite for Destruction and early Metallica stuff yeah. uh, with Cliff Burton still playing and Iron Maiden and, and things like that, where whether I knew it or not, the reoccurring theme was actually like, you could hear the bass player and typically it was a he and he was doing some pretty cool shit. Yeah. And, you know, Duff McKagan had nice melodic lines. He was not buried in the mix, you know, like, that bass was in your face. Um, Metallica back when you could actually hear bass playing in, <laughs> in Metallica tunes. And so I, I started really getting into that. And then the sort of pivot starts happening with you get, you get into Chili Peppers stuff and then Primus kind mm -hmm. of hits. And Primus... Primus is, that's a big one for you. Oh, yeah, it's a big one. Oh, um, <laughs> You, I had never heard anything like that in like 1990, 1991. Yeah. And it just, it blew my mind. And I'm like, I want to do that. Because that yeah. guy is, it's all about him. I don't know what he's doing, but I want to do it. <laughs> he just, I just listened to a podcast of his today. He was chatting to a chap and they've recorded three new songs. One of them's 13 minutes long. Primus, <laughs> Primus I'm talking about now. So I'm excited to hear that. That's going to be good. And, and, you know, fast forward, not to get ahead of the story, but fast forward, you know, years later, and I end up touring with Primus, and I get to Amazing. play Les's bass while he plays drums and jam with him on his yeah. gear. Oh, wow. And I get to have, you know, I don't know if anybody really knows Les, but my <laughs> own version of, of some sort of functional relationship, seeing him every night and getting to appreciate just how much of a character he really is. I mean... It's not an act. He is, <laughs> he is, he is, he is that, that man. guy. He is that man. God love him. Um, that's, that was, yeah, I was going to ask you if you possibly knew him or, you know, had meetings with him or anything like that. So that's good. Is there any other guys throughout time that you've uh, bumped into and thought, I like this character, I like this cat? Well, I, I mean, I've been fortunate enough to to tour with a lot of interesting people over the years. and. I mean, every band's got a, a dynamic and, you know, it's it's always full of personalities. I, I clicked really early on um, <laughs> with Robert Trujillo, who who now plays in, you know, Metallica. Yeah, yeah. I knew him and got into him with Infectious Grooves yeah, in, you know, the early, early 90s. He was another one of those guys, you know, he, they're playing like semi meat metal, but funk, and it's all about slap bass and, yeah. and just attitude. And he's a crazy player. And we toured with uh, Ozzy on a bunch of Ozfest um, dates over the years, and he was playing bass for Ozzy. And Robert's just hands down one of the nicest guys I've ever met. And he was rowdy as fuck back in the day. <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget. I, I'll share, I'll share a story about Trujillo that I, I'm sure he might be slightly embarrassed about, but he, he knows it to be true. We, <laughs> we, we played the form in LA um, a long time ago and Robert came and I remember being backstage, uh, I think it was after the show and we were sitting around a, a large table that looked like it was kind of in a banquet room. Um, and he, at some point asked me where the bathroom was and I, I think I took a minute and, you know, answering the question or said, I didn't know. And the next thing I know, he just takes a red solo cup, puts, slams it on the table because he's just decided to piss underneath the table into his own cup. And it was just like problem solved. And in, in many ways, that was just, that was just Robert. He's zero fucks to give, you know, he was cheered off his back, but he, you know, he's a rowdy cat. 
I'm guessing he's probably toned it down at this point. But <laughs> yeah, that will forever be burned into my mind. You know, over the years, I've, I've met all kinds of, of wonderful people and players. And, you know, when you're on these long tours in the middle of nowhere with people, you, you know, you kind of get to know them a little bit. Yeah, that's, you know, cool. that's cool. Odd situations. I was one of my favorites is um uh not I'm not not so into the band but I do like what he does is is Peanut from 311. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's a guy, he's out there. I think he used to work bass as well like you did. Yeah. Back in the day. Yeah. So yeah. Um no. spent a lot of time uh with Nut over the years playing basketball, touring. There you go. Um they gave us our first uh opening slot on like a major U.S. tour, you know, they were out doing arenas right when they had kind of blown up, even though they'd been around for a number of years, kind of doing the the club and theater circuit. They they had a hit and we went out with them and got a lot of respect for those guys. I mean, I, I still chat every once in a while with with Peanut and, and touch base with him, not as often as I would like. Um, good guy, tall fucking guy. Good basketball player. Yeah. Um, but he, you know, that was another example of a band where the bass is definitely in the forefront. You know, what he's doing is interesting. It's moving things along. And another just genuinely nice human being um, that I've been fortunate enough to, to get to know over the years. So would you say... Um... With the early Incubus kind of stuff, is that a position you tried to fill yourself, being less like the bass player who stands at the back with the drums, but playing a more forward, forward kind of role? I didn't. I, I think whether I whether I intended to or not, I gravitated towards music that really put that instrument and the people who played it into the forefront. You know. If you like a metal band and you like Iron Maiden, Steve Harris is in your face. Nice. He's got one foot up on the, the monitor and he's, you know, he's pointing at you and he's galloping <laughs> with three finger, fingers, you know, <laughs> and, and he's writing the songs and like, yeah, Bruce Dickinson's like the singer, but nobody gives a shit about anybody other than Steve, <laughs> you know, Steve Harris. He's like, he's running that thing. And um, I think it's also just a personality thing. There's some people who are going to be doing their best work standing in the back. And there's some people whose personalities refuse to let them be anywhere other than the front. <laughs> and I'm just an asshole who has to be up front. Um, but also I think that, you know, from a performance standpoint, you kind of just figure out where you want to be and how you want to do it. We were playing a style of music that tended to be more, um, active. There was no sitting back in the pocket and just, you know, nodding. It was, it was frantic. It was high school yeah. shit. You know, we didn't do subtle. It's interesting as I've gotten a lot older and, and I'm not really playing that style of music. I've had to figure out like, how do I perform when I'm not playing a song that's 150 BPM? Yeah. When there is an actual pocket and, and it's almost about the notes that you're not playing as much as it is. Look at, you know, look at this, look at this. Yeah. Um, so, so that's but you know, not to mention that after playing bass for like 25 or 30 years, like my body's all fucked up. I, I had a doctor look at me that's the other the day. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I went in for physical therapy for something, and she she looks at me and she's like, You do know your shoulders are uneven <laughs> and your pelvis is tucked. I'm like, Well, the pelvis is because I can't see the fretboard unless I'm you know Just doing this. There, and the yeah. shoulders are 25 years of holding a, a bass on one on one thing like man people five, ever yeah. say I, I they didn't sacrifice i've sacrificed for this, <laughs> this part. I, I, I walk around like quasimodo i'm just like it's all all messed up you know <laughs> well that's that's one thing i was i did want to ask you today actually is that um i, I guess I know, oh yeah exactly yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I know your your baseline's pretty intimately, don't I? Whether it's inc Incubus stuff or East of June. You know them better than me at this point. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they are always, they're always interesting. They're always intriguing. They're always, um, it's never 
Although you're always trying, you're always, you're always serving the song. It's not just a root based approach. You always try and put your own spin and your own personality on it. But I guess you're in a position where someone gives you a song and a chord sequence and say, right, here's the song. What can you do with it? What's your process to making sure that you're, you're putting, you're putting your own take upon it? I think that for somebody who's been in bands um, and original bands at that for, for as long as I have, like you, you hear music a certain way. I, you know, I just watched, this is a little bit of a non sequitur, but I swear it all connects. I just watched that, that Beatles documentary, um, Get Back. And it was fascinating to me that over the course of probably, you know, was like almost nine hours of, of music, as much as you hear Beatles songs, what you really hear are them just playing covers and playing songs that they love. And it, it dawned on me that I don't have, I've never had that kind of repertoire where I know a whole bunch of songs. I knew the songs that I wrote. So early on, I was focused on how I heard things as opposed to, well, this is what this guy does and this is how he hears the song. Whenever I listen to music, I'm, I'm constantly amazed by the choices that people make because some of them seem obvious and, and a lot of them just wouldn't occur to me because I have got such tunnel vision at times about the way that I play the instrument. And it's not even so much how you physically play it. I mean, there's really only so many ways that you can, you can do that. But to your question, like if you hear a, a, you know, a chord change sequence of four chords, like where, where are you in that song? And for me, it almost always begins with, with rhythm. What is going on with the drums? How, how do I hear where I should be in that space? And then where are the melodic moments that, that make sense? I prefer to actually write against a vocal that's already there because it gives me a frame of reference to, to how to weave in and out. That's not to say that I haven't come up with, with parts and, you know, riff writing where you're like, okay, this is cool. I, I, I dig this and it exists in its own world and it'll be now somebody else's job to work around me. But I find more of the interesting playing comes from, you've given me these sort of, these points in space and time and how do I connect the dots through this? And then it becomes this process where, well, if I did that, then somebody's going to have to pivot. A lot of it's, I guess, the analogy of a couple of people in a rowboat. Somebody stands up, everyone's going to have to adjust so this thing doesn't fucking tip over. And, you know, a song may begin one way, but by the time you start adding some of these points to it, everybody eventually makes the shifts. And a lot of times I'll start someplace from a writing standpoint and then get to a place where you might consider the song like potentially done and then circle back and go, okay, now that I know where we're trying to get to, here's how I'm going to make this work a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that's also sometimes editing. Um, and I don't mean necessarily just in like the computer or something like that, like a little bit of self editing going, all right, you have a tendency to over fucking play. Play, you know <laughs> why where do you really need to be playing and can you can you censor yourself that can also be smothering to to songs and you know the current project that i'm in is much more song oriented and so sometimes that requires taking a taking a step back and not giving into some of those instincts right yeah, yeah. okay seven notes it's going to take seven notes in this bar to get this <laughs> done. You know. but say like a song like Little Bird, which is my personal favorite that you guys do currently, um, you're, you're still like Aiden played me your band before I knew it was your band. And but I could still hear you. I could still hear your playing style. I'm like, that's uh, that's definitely good. You know what I mean? So Little Bird came about from you reacting to something that was presented to you or is that something you took to them? So, so Little Bird's an interesting sort of story. Now, there's going to be another version of that song that's going to come out that actually we took it to a slightly more reggae place. Yeah. So it's not that the baseline in itself has actually changed, but the feel about halfway pivots to a little bit more 
it's got a little bit more of a skank to it. Um, Kyle and Emily had had kind of worked out in the beginning of COVID, they'd kind of worked out the, the chord arrangements and a bit of a feel for this thing. And I actually started out with a sound that I, that I liked. And it, you know, I've got this 65 jazz with mm. um, flat wounds on it. And I, I never play with a pick, um, but I kind of had it in my head when I started listening to this thing well, this, this song needs like a, it needs an angle to it. And I started thinking of, you know, Jermaker, uh, Led Zeppelin, you know, you know, and so palm muting, right hand palm muting that and playing with the pick and really kind of alternating between whole notes and really kind of staccato stuff. Like it just had a vibe to it. Yeah. And the song really didn't, you know, it had these really pretty changes in melody, but it didn't have like, it didn't have a feel. And so the more I played around with it, the more it was like, okay, here's where I hear the feel. And we didn't have a drummer at the time. So we essentially just programmed something that kind of worked with where we, what we had access to. And so now the version of this that has live drums on it, it just, it has a little bit more movement to it. So I'll see if I can't send you guys something to, to preview. Oh, yeah. Before yeah, it. I'd love that. Yeah, that Because be Little Bird is the one I'm struggling the most with writing out, isn't it? Because because the bass is palm muting and it's, yeah, it's kind of Some, lower. It's got that thumpy clump. It sounds I love great. It. It's, it's great. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't have thought that the jazz bass would have been able to really kind of do that sound. But, you know, I think... And I didn't, because I'm not a pick player, I didn't realize just how much the choice of an actual pick influences mm. the sound on a tune, yeah. you know? I'm used to fingers, you play as hard as you possibly can. There's no yeah. subtlety. <laughs> and so I had, to, I had to develop a little bit of subtlety and I'm also not good at playing with a pick. I just don't do that well. <laughs> and it's not like it's a super complicated song. Um, you know, I think the the high points of it are probably more melody than anything else, but just holding the fucking thing is not, <laughs> not good at it. <laughs> so, I mean, one when we've spoken before for Water Bear, one of my favourite stories that you told us, and I'd love you to, if you don't mind repeating it for Carl, was the story from Incubus becoming a high school band to um, going out with Corn. Is that right? Was that one of your first tours? Uh, yeah. That was that was our first tour in, in, in Europe. Um, I, I mean... Most most kids that I know who start a band in high school, it's, you know, you get friends together, somebody plays this instrument, somebody plays that instrument. I mean, I think we kind of established how I ended up playing bass. And I went to a high school where um, I was kind of the new kid. I didn't come in from the, the previous sort of feeder schools where people had been in school for years and years together and they just kind of, you know, matriculated up to the next grade. So I didn't know anybody. Um, I joined jazz band my freshman year and was belittled because I didn't know how to read music. I mean, I could play the instrument, but I didn't know anything about the instrument. And as a result of getting shamed for being um, musically inept, I got connected with some other people who just played and I didn't really know them. I mean, I'd see them at school, but I didn't know them. I, I think for the longest time, I thought Brandon, who was ultimately the singer of the band, I thought he was a chick. You know, just, um, <laughs> no, yeah, I never really saw his face. He was always from behind. He just had the prettiest hair you'd ever seen on a, on a, <laughs> um, but we, I started jamming with, with some guys and you know, it was, it was my mom's garage. It was their parents' garage. And, you know, eventually we all, it, it became a band. Um, a buddy of mine had kind of been singing for us. And then Brandon came along. We're like, we're going to go. He, he's got nicer hair. We're going with this guy. <laughs> um, but when you're in high school, you have, uh, there's just access to kids. And one of the biggest struggles about being in a band is, can you get anybody to show up to, to any of your gigs? And, you know, there'd be high school parties. We'd play them. Um, 
eventually we started playing clubs and we were able to effectively promote ourselves because <clears throat> not only did we have a lot of friends between the four of us, excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, um, but we had friends who went to multiple high schools. So you'd get um, people to flyer their high school for you. Uh, Kyle, guitar player in my current band, I, I met him 30 years ago because he was the guy who would flyer his high school for us. <laughs> He went on to work at our record label and be involved in promotion and help help us break in some other more random middle America markets. But that was what you did. There was nothing to do locally on a weekend, a Friday or Saturday. If somebody wasn't having a party, well, Incubus would be playing a show in Hollywood. And people would either drive themselves or get their parents to drop them off. And it was the thing to do. And so it allowed us to build a fan base in a way that, you know, as a much older adult now, I can never do. I mean, I call my friends and be like, hey, you would come to my show. They're like, ah, Tuesday, 10 o'clock. <laughs> now, I've, I've got work. I've got children. I don't even like you that much. No, I'm not. <laughs> oh, man, that's me. It's just me at the minute. It's all good, though. <laughs> well, but it's, it's real life because, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I don't need, I don't want to be playing that late either. I'm like, <laughs> it, it's this cruise ship gig. And I'm like, 11 o'clock? Dear God, you know? <laughs> um, but you know, we got through high school and we're, we're selling out clubs and I ended up going away to college, but stayed close enough to be able to, to, um, still play with the band. So when we got a record deal, you know, we, we got in a van, started touring and then our label mates at the time, Corn, uh, I'm sure there was some backroom dealing that got that done but they took us to Europe and you know we had our first taste of what it was like to you know really go on a tour and and play in front of an audience and I'll be forever grateful for for Europe because people in everywhere it seems everywhere but America are just not jaded about music they genuinely want to go experience something and they're happy that you showed up here like People come to your own concert and they're pissed you're putting it on. Like it's inconvenient to them. <laughs> <clears throat> but we, we would go to, you know, Brixton Hall or, you know, some of these other places around England and there's people lined up all day long and they're like, you're a new band. Let's give it a shot. Let's see if we like you. You know, in America, it's, my God, the contempt. Um, <laughs> Why is that, do you think? What? what, what? Because we have access to anything and everything. And what it really is, it's not all of America. It's it's the coasts. And it's, it's LA. It's New York. It's okay. people who have everything at their fingertips. And so it's like, impress me. Okay. You go into the middle of the country, you go to South Dakota or Minnesota or Kansas or some of these other places, people are genuinely glad to see you. Yep. And... Maybe that's because their town's small and they're tired of the people who live in that town. But, you know, there's just a different level of enthusiasm. And I mean, look, if you're in a band, all you're trying to do is connect with somebody and have them give you a shot, discover what it is that's unique about what you do. And maybe they like you, maybe they don't, but they, they buy in for that 30 minutes at least. And then mm -hmm. kind of, you see if, if you've done something to impress them. And I would I would see it actually when when we would go play with Black Sabbath or play with and Pantera is the opening band for for Black Sabbath and we're opening for Pantera. It, it's a hard room. I mean, we play our heaviest <laughs> stuff, but there's nothing that we were ever going to play that was going to compete with like you know Mouth for War, Pantera, <laughs> you know anything that Sabbath had ever done. So you get these people who are just standing like there in the audience so like. Fucking okay, yeah, get it over. <laughs> and by the end, you know, begrudgingly, you'd see some head nodding. And then it was like, these guys are all right. All right. There's, <laughs> there's something here. I'm not sure how I feel about it, but there's something here. Um, so it's true, though. When, when, when Incubus came over, we were grateful, weren't we? And we oh, were yeah. like, we're going to clear the diary. We're going to be there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I think I think I think I think you're right. I think it's the mentality of whether that kind of thing happens every day or whether that kind of thing happens every 
I don't know, 18 months for us, probably when a band comes over and we're like, yes, we're doing it. Yeah, so we do, so yeah it's probably gratitude, I think. <laughs> I, yeah, and just a love, a love of music. I think that, I think music is, is worldwide and it is international and it transcends cultures. I think that music is an interesting microcosm of what's happening culturally. And I don't mean specific to a genre. I mean, just like, how open-minded are you at any particular point in time? You know, how, how much are you influenced by what is popular everywhere else versus just an independent streak to discover new things? Um, and I think some of that is, is generational and age-based. I think we reach a point in our lives where we're just not as open-minded. I mean, shit, I know it's true for me. Um, and yet that also kind of is cyclical where I will have been really cynical and not interested in music until I find something that just resonates with me and I rediscover what I love about music. Um, and I tend to, when I'm writing, I, I almost don't listen to a ton of music, but then once like a song is getting a little bit closer to being finished and I'm starting to think about how that production is actually going to come together and, and how a mix should sound and, and how you start kind of polishing it. I actually go back and start listening to music again because I sort of start free associating with things. Mm -hmm. So we, um, we have a, a song on, on our, our latest EP called Lazy Sunday. And it was an acoustic tune that I had kind of written. And I'm, I'm barely proficient on guitar, but I took it upon myself that like, I'm gonna play guitar in this whole fucking thing. Um, but as the song started coming together and it was, it was more than just chord changes, it was like, well, what is this supposed to sound like? And so I started, you know, reaching out there for inspiration. And best thing I could come up with is, you know, this Neil Young song, Harvest Moon. Oh, right. um, okay. And I'm not a huge Neil. Actually, I, I really don't care for Neil Young for the most part. But I happen to really like this song. And there's aspects of the production and just thematically how it all kind of comes together as an arrangement. I'm like, okay, now I find myself listening to that song all day long. And it's not to crib like a chord change or anything like that. But it's just what is the vibe of this tune and why am I liking it so much right now? And it's, it's almost like a musical Rorschach test where you, you hear something or you, and you're just like, okay, this is how this fits into where I'm at right now in my life. You mentioned Kyle flowering for you in the early days. Has he, has he been there? Since, obviously he's been there through your life since then. And then all of a sudden you just decided, right, let's do a band. Or have you always thought this or... Yeah, I mean, we, we've been friends for a long, long time and had pursued sort of different paths in music. Um, he played when he was in high school and, and probably his early 20s, but he had stepped away from, from focusing on playing and getting more into the business side of things, management, um, marketing, you know, working in various other music-related endeavors. And... Uh, he, God, it's gotta have been like six or seven years ago. He, he kind of said, Hey, I'm, I'm starting to, to write some stuff. Will you, will you listen and tell me what you think? And being the kind of friend I am, I, I listened to his stuff. I'm like, okay, so what is it you want to hear? Like, do you, want, do you, want to be, you know, do you want to be in a band or are you content to stay in your house and and noodle with music because you're going to get two different answers based on what what it is that you're looking to do and he's like well i think i would like to consider you know getting out of the you know the feedback loop that is just playing in my house and like what do i do with this and i go all right well here's what i would do and those conversations kept coming up often enough that it was like okay we might as well be doing this together um and then doing it together turned into, well, maybe we should find somebody to sing on this stuff. And he was, he had this vision. He's like, we need a female singer. You know, we need to do something cool and have a really awesome female singer to be on it. And so that became a quest to find that. And the idea originally was still just to, to write songs. You know, we had busy lives and no one wanted to go 
try and be in a band. But after a while, we found, you know, Emily and we started writing songs. And as we got through the demoing and production phase of this stuff, before we were prepared to start sending it out to other people to see if they wanted the songs, kind of dawned on us like, this is a band. We don't have a drummer, but this is a band. Um, And it was kind of like an aha moment that how do you make this work if we're the ones actually doing it? And I, I think sometimes it's just, you know, it's just sort of serendipity where you are in your life and what you've got the bandwidth for, no pun intended. But we were in a place, the three of us to say like, okay, let's, let's see if we can't give this a go. Um, so that's what we've been doing. And we timed it perfectly. I mean, we got all ready and then, you know, we had a pandemic. <laughs> so couldn't have timed that more perfect. Um, but now that we're kind of coming out the other side of that, we, we get to be a bit of a live band and, you know, see what it's like to take something out of the rehearsal room and out of the studio and, and present it to an audience and see how it's actually received. And that's always kind of the most rewarding part of it because it's, it's just a different animal entirely to be in the echo chamber of, of a recording session and then there's okay but what's it like when you actually plug in and try and do it mm. do you have to change much i mean i guess you have, to, you have to scale things down i guess Ian. well yes and no i mean we've you know when we went and did this ship thing you know we've we've put uh horns on tunes we've we've had layered guitars there's a lot of production, but we figured out ways to have that translate into a way where we can do it as, uh, as a five piece band. And technically we can do it as a four piece band. Um, there's a lot of different iterations of what we've been able to do. I, I kind of believe that I had my first manager years ago said, you know, you'll know it's a good song if you can strip all of it away to just an acoustic guitar and it's, and it's just as good in its own way. Um, because a great song, I think, will sort of translate across all those formats. Um, my preference would be, you know, arena rock, um, but, you know, we'll bide our time on that one and, and a little bit more intimate in the meantime. <laughs> Was the pandemic fruitful writing-wise, or did it just all come to a kind of a stop, standstill, or did you did you bash on through? It, it lit a fire under our asses um, once we got through the first few months where, you know, we were trying to write songs over Zoom and I didn't know anything about Zoom and I was getting so pissed at the singer. I'm like, why can't you fucking sing against the chord change playing? and not realizing that there's a lag? And- <laughs> You're out of time. <laughs> yeah, I, I really owed her an apology afterwards. I'm like, okay. That's, that's not going to work. So we we collectively decided that we're going to get in a bubble as a band. We're going to have honest conversations about who we're interacting with in our lives and how we're going to live our lives so that we can be comfortable in a room together. And, you know, we'd attempted that masked, you know, 12 feet apart. And eventually it was like, look, we, we need to just all pinky swear that we're going to be on our best behavior. Yeah. And we did that. And so what happened was we, we had all these grandiose plans for how we were going to release music and, and, you know, how we, how we drawn it up in the huddle, so to speak. And then the, the reality set in and it was like, okay, the only thing that we can control is the writing and recording of music, the releasing up for, up for grabs. I mean, we, we ran into issues on, on YouTube and, and whatnot with people claiming that it wasn't even our own music, like oh. getting flagged for copyright infringement of our own songs. I'm like, how the fuck is that even possible? <laughs> like, anyway, um, but, it, but it lit a fire under us that we were gonna really have to do this ourselves. And we just decided to grind. And grind was, you know, you write, you record, and you put it out regardless of whether or not it's, it's gonna be seen by anybody right now. We just kind of refused to, to cave in and, and completely shut things down. 
And I'm, I'm glad that we didn't, you know, it, it felt like a little bit of a lost couple of years, but I think we became um, better writers and producers as a, as a result of that. Um, with Incubus, of course, there was no streaming, there was no internet, I guess, really, back in the early 90s. And then it was east of June, the whole landscape has shifted, hasn't it? So it's, a bit, it's yeah. been completely different this time for you. Well, the music, the music business has shifted in the sense that, you know, the, the challenge was making it through the gate through the gatekeepers, if you will. And that was typically like a record company and a record company would then work hard to get you through the next gate or goalpost, which was radio yeah. and then MTV. And if you could get through all these milestones in the video game, so to speak, you would unlock bonus levels, like <laughs> oh, the, ability to tour, the ability to tour and perhaps, you know, make some money. Um, and so all the gatekeepers are gone for the most part but that just means all the punters are rushing the fucking pitch at the same time so it is tough to stand out um and so you know in some ways the music business has been democratized but that comes with a different set of of struggles and troubles uh, I like the fact that I don't have to have a record company to write a song, record a song, and put it out to everybody. Okay. The only downside is that every other knucklehead gets to do the same thing. Exactly. So, you know, what are you going to do to make yours stand out? And, you know, it's, it, it's interesting because never in a million years would I have found myself caring about numbers on Instagram having been on TikTok or anything like that but you know you can stay rooted in your old ways or, or just recognize that people are getting their content in different formats and so it's been a a learning experience of how to pivot that to an attention span that is measured in seconds yeah um the idea of somebody going I, yeah i'm gonna i heard about a record i'm gonna listen to it from beginning to end to see what i feel about it and then I'll make a decision if I'm going to be a fan. Bullshit. <laughs> you know, you, you got you got five seconds now. Yeah. And and even then, those are a contemptuous five seconds with people starting off like, I know I'm going to dislike this. <laughs> um, and then the revelation is like, well, I didn't hate that as much as I thought I did. <laughs> so, you know, the the only constant is is change, I suppose, and that's you'd like to think that good music will kind of rise to the top and, and perhaps it does. Although I've seen over the years, a lot of really talented people who are amazing songwriters or players and you know, the struggle is real. Like it, it's not just talent rising to the top. A lot of that is, is luck timing. And, you know, I'm, I'm constantly amazed with the caliber of people I see who are, who are still in the trenches, mm. you know, and, and I'm currently in the trenches with them, you know, mm. like there are no laurels to rest on because no one cares really what you did last month, last year, 20 years ago. It's what have you done for me lately? Mm -hmm. um, because there's just, there's so many choices. You cannot coast on, on what you used to do anymore. You've got to innovate. Mm. It's very true. It's very true. It's like, um, I've got to do this because there's a lot of bass players who listen. <laughs> are you a gear geek or like myself and Aiden, or are you more <laughs> of a, it's just your weapon of choice and it, it's a tool you use, you know, to get um, what's in here out or have you, well, how's your, how has your gear changed since Incubus to Eastern? My Eastern? gear hasn't changed. No? I still have all the same stuff and I refuse to change change anything because I'm not really as much of a gear geek. I, I put together a long time ago what absolutely worked for me, which was a hybrid um, analog and, and digital setup um, where, you know, I was going through an Eden um, WT-800 head because I absolutely loved the way that 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 pre, uh, the tube and the pre and all the, um, the parametric EQ that you had control over in terms of shaping a sound. Yeah. And it just worked really well with 
I'd always built it around what I was doing with my Warwick. And, and so when I kind of expanded a little bit to, to play some jazz based stuff or some different tonal stuff, I, I had to make a few adjustments, but I had analog effects pedals that I really liked, you know, on a big muff. I had, um, uh, a boss phaser and an MXR 90, but I, I did not like having to do the, the foot stomp where I'm trying to do like three things three. at the same time. So I had a, a rig built where there was MIDI switching on the pedal board through the analog um, pedals. And I combined that with uh, Sans Amp that I've always just been a huge fan of what Sans Amp does in terms of just giving you some bite Mm -hmm. um yeah. the the big muffs a completely different sound from a distortion standpoint um you know one's just got attack and, and treble and, and the other is just <laughs> so i i had that and i really liked what it did and then i started stepping away from effects based stuff for the most part and everything was a little bit more about the actual playing and like what do i do with the instrument itself and what do i do with my hands to make something sound a little bit different um i'm not i'm not as cutting edge as i would like to be i freely admit it there are things that i hear other people do and i'm like damn that's that's awesome it's just it's not me and you know, I, I don't want to pigeonhole myself too much, but it's required access to a few other instruments that I have now that, and in different types of songs, you know, when I was in Incubus, we did that thing. Um, and now in East of June, you may have a song that's that's got a dub feel, but then there is a rock tune that that has distorted bass. And then there's something that's more, you know, disco y. So what is what is that going to sound like? Um, so I'm I'm bouncing back and forth on a, on a, on a number of different instruments, and you know, when you have to carry your own shit from point A to point B, you start thinking about like, okay, how can I do all of this in an easier, smarter way? Um, so I'm, I'm I may be looking at at modding or, or building something that's actually going to work for me that's that's meant to remove three bases and do it in, in one if you will side note i had the ability to play the other day like a 2001 fender custom shop jocko fretless heavy relic thing oh and dear god the neck on that thing was the nicest neck on a bass i have ever <laughs> I've never, played i've never seen one in real life yeah it was mind blowing, and I'm kind of I'm kind of kicking myself that I I just I couldn't I couldn't bring myself to buy it because I'm like I do not need this at all. <laughs> not there is zero part of me that needs it. I don't want it. Yeah, so, they, so which one wins? That's the question. Need and want. <laughs> well, <a> struggle. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I didn't do it, but I know that it's out there now. And um, man, oh man, like I I don't know. I might I might have to. Uh, have to go talk to the fender people and assuming they would even take a phone call for me and be like look we need we need to have a talk about some stuff how, how do we make this happen this like to work. i need that neck on this body yeah with this pickup configuration mm -hmm. and we'll see next next east of june video i'm predicting that's what we're saying yeah let's you heard it here first <laughs> i mean some people are into cars yeah i you know, I can't say I'm I'm not a bass collector. I have a number of basses, but I, I'm by no means a collector. Um, because I don't play that much to be honest. <laughs> um anyway, that was a little bit of a long-winded answer about gear. I you know, I think I'm a little bit more particular in the studio in terms of signal chain. Um obviously it, it starts with the bass, like what is a bass capable of doing and what's the right instrument for the job, and then where is where is this going through signal chain you know my my perfect world i'm still doing things analog i i want a neve um yeah you know i i want a, a really nice di on the front end avalon or demeter or something like that and then 
I would, I would prefer to go through a 1073 and then start working my way into the digital workspace if necessary. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I do not necessarily miss the days of having to cut tunes on tape <laughs> and, you know, stop start like did you did we get it did we punch it right you know i think there are certain things that are really nice about the way that digital allows you to record but there's just something to be said and this is you know me being all old man get off my lawn but the olden days were better (laughs) that was that was that not the the morning view um recording that was analog into into early kind of digital is that right If if i remember that right so Make Yourself the Record Before Morning View was still done analog, but um, the drums were done into an early version of Pro Tools for the ability to edit and to not have to go back. Drum editing on tape was was just a nightmare um, because then you find yourself going back and trying to trigger uh, if, oh, the kick drum's not as you know, spot on as you're or not as punchy as you would want it. So we're going to go back and we're going to trigger something. So make yourself was, was very much analog uh, on the front end with a tiny bit of a digital component because Pro Tools was really just kind of in its, in its infancy then. And then a couple of years later, you fast forward even just two years later, morning view was all done into a computer, but analog on the front end. So that was going through a Neve sidecar, you know, like eight channel, all the drums going through their Neve um, pre's. Bass was all done with analog pre's, but everything was being put into the computer. Um, at that point, it was already difficult to, uh, to get tape. Tape is, tape's a messy situation. I think it sounds wonderful, but there's something to be said for the ease of use of not having tape. And because Morning View was done in a house as opposed to a studio, bringing in a tape operator like whose sole job is to do tape was it just it wasn't cost effective time effective it just wasn't the way that we were going to be able to do it um i don't think i've recorded on tape in in probably almost you know probably almost 20 years Mm. uh if if offered the opportunity yeah i i think i would want to do it um it's, I think you benefit from having been a live band who, you know, the way that we used to write songs and write records is a lot of that material or a portion of that material would get worked up on tour. You know, you'd kind of get to a place where you were really, you knew what you were doing. Um, so you got the best version of it when you decided to actually hit record, whether it was on a tape machine or even uh, digitally. Now, there are times when I do a song like, I don't know what the drums are going to be like the song's not even finished or written. You're just kind of, you're working on it sometimes in a little bit of a vacuum, which is why for me it's important and and why I do that kind of free association with, well, where am I trying to get, you know, what are some songs that sound like where I'm trying to get to, because I don't have all the pieces. I haven't played it with a, with a full band on tour for six months to go. Yeah. And here's what, these are the changes we should make. Like you're just making decisions and hoping that it's all going to work out in the end. Um, Which is why I, you know, I like to model some of these things off of the vibe of the song that I'm familiar with. Mm -hmm. And so, so where, where do you sit with the, um, we're talking about tape machines and stuff. For example, you can buy digital emulations of tape machines and then you can buy digital emulations of Ampeg amps. And is that something, I mean, do you think they really stand up against the originals? No, but uh, if you're in a situation where you want something to sound like an SVT and you don't have an SVT and your decision was, well, I'm going to do something else or I'm going to emulate, emulate all day long. Mm -hmm. Um, If you were ever to give me the option of having an SVT or having an emulator, I will take the SVT every single time. Same thing with... And... Uh, you know, a computer, I take the tape machine because there is something to be said for, you know, all the things that they're trying to allow you to do and to emulate, you can't emulate. Tape saturation, you know, it's the harmonics that happen between those circuit, those actual circuits, preamps, tubes, and stuff like that. 
no one knows how the fuck most of that stuff even works. Mm -hmm. You know, it just does. And that's why they are trying to do it in the first place because there was something so magical about that. No one would be trying to duplicate it if it didn't sound better. Yeah. You know, yeah. now granted 99% of the population is never going to know. And so like, like you, you kind of got to figure out like where you want to put your time and energy into it. Uh, I don't think I would chase tape. I don't think I would chase vintage gear. If, if there was an easier, softer way to, to do it and doing it in the box does allow you a lot of, a lot of flexibility because, you know, it used to be like, well, you'd call a guy and he'd bring over five amps and you pay for that. And maybe you liked one of them. Maybe you liked none of them. And now you can just scroll through a menu and go, okay, I'm going to try uh, a JCM 800. And then I'm going to try, you know, a Hughes and Kettner. Although half these things aren't actually named any of this stuff. because No one wants to pay for all the plugins. Exactly. So. <laughs> uh, but I, I think it's good. My preference is a good microphone, a real speaker, and a loud fucking amp in the right situation. And it does things that the computer won't do. Mm -hmm. The computer cannot simulate that breaking point where the guitar player is just close enough to the amp and the microphone that something magical happens. Like, that doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, they're close, and I think they're, they're wonderful for what they are. And that's, I think that's part of the, the democratization of music, where it used to be that if you wanted to record, you had to have a lot of money to go in and get something done. And then the DIY movement kind of started, but the gear was so out of whack with what a real studio sounded like that you, you didn't sound good because the gear wasn't good. And then no one could afford the good stuff anymore. So that became few and far between. And the DIY stuff, you know, is absolutely on a par with anything that you're going to get for the most part at a real fancy studio. Having said that, I went into a real fancy studio not that long ago and was on a 48 channel Neve in a, in a vintage room with all the analog stuff. I'm like, okay, <laughs> this, you cannot convince me that any, anything compares to this yeah but the only question is do you do you need it it doesn't make the song any better i mean shit uh, that's you, true lyrics stuck in your melody is no good i don't care how good your gear is <laughs> only the bass player would care about that <laughs> <laughs> what's um what's next what's next for your band what's the uh what's think, upcoming uh, apart from sending us that tune <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. uh <laughs> i think it's I think it's um, I think it's new music. Um, you know, I think that some of the stuff that we did didn't get a fair shake because of the circumstances of the world. Um, and it's not a woe is me thing. It's just I was very proud of the the EP Omens and Signs that we put out, but there's a lot going on. Mm. You know. Middle of World War III is not a great time to release new music either. <laughs> um, so at some point, though, you, you can't really time this to, to anything. It's just you, you do the best work that you can. You put it out there. Uh, I think we want to write and record some new stuff. Um, there is something cathartic and infuriating about that process. I mean, it's, you know you get a number of people who have opinions together and you, you knife fight it out and uh, let the best idea win. Um, but there's something really exciting about that, that process and taking, making something out of nothing. Um, and it's, it's kind of like just taking a snapshot of a moment in time, like, well, here's that thing that we did. And that is right now. And, you know, Little Bird doesn't sound like Little Bird from two years ago. So you can reinvent yourself a little bit, but that will forever have been that particular moment in time. And um, I'm looking forward to that. You know, I've, I've, got, I've got ideas. I know that my partners have ideas too. 
we'll see what we can agree upon. <laughs> Do you like uh, talking about releasing material in the future? Are you enjoying what, like, say, Spotify's doing, where you can you can put two songs out, you can put a single out, just pop it on there, pop it on there. Do you like that, or is that not something? Do you like? Do you prefer the entirety of an album, or are you happy to just release the the drip and drab sort of thing? You know what I mean? The... Well, I think there's pros and cons, and I think it depends upon what it is that your band's trying to do. I don't know that I would release a concept album like one song at a time. You know, like Operation Mind Crime, I don't think hits quite the same. If you're going to dole it out every six weeks, you get like a new song, <laughs> unless you unless you really set it up that way, where the album or the narrative of a, of a record is serialized, you know, and episode one is this, and then it mm -hmm. takes you into episode two. I think there's something cool about the fact that if you want to put a song out, you can put a song out. Yeah. Um, I, you know, like most people who are in, in the DIY space, you're throwing everything up against the wall and just hoping that something's going to stick. Mm -hmm. And everyone's got an opinion on how you're supposed to do it, but there's no guarantee that what worked last time is going to work this time. And I think that you're going to find even successful artists who cannot duplicate what they did in the past because they happen to catch a particular moment and circumstances just worked out. And sometimes I think it's the song. Sometimes I think it's where that song lands on any given Friday um, in relation to everything else that's going on in the world world and with people having such a short attention span there's not a lot of anticipation built around music as much anymore because there's always something new um and people's desire to have something new is is what continues to to drive that you know it used to be that you'd hear rumblings that your favorite band was gonna be back in the studio and then you'd hear that maybe a record was going to be coming out and then there'd be a promotional push. No one just fucking dropped a record on Friday and didn't tell you what was happening. You know, like that just was unheard of. Um, but tomorrow, you know, 40,000 people are going to drop a record or, or a song on Spotify. Yeah, and those yeah. are just, the, might even be more than 40,000. Um, <clears throat> it's a lot of noise. And it's hard to, it's kind of hard to, to rise through it, but it means that anybody can do it. Yeah. You know, every, everyone's got a fighting chance, which is, which is kind of cool. Um, I wish it was easier. I wish it was easier for everybody. You know, there's enough of us and enough music to go around. That's mm -hmm. why I do wish it was easier, but you know, anybody who, who gets into this because they, you know, they're guaranteeing themselves they're going to get, you know, fame and riches has clearly been sold a false bill of goods. You do this because you love it. And if you happen to get lucky, cool. Because mm -hmm. um, it's a grind. Yeah. It seems you that guys know. The, 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 the crap money that Spotify pays, 0 0.003, whatever, I don't know how many zeros, um, it has repitched things because I guess back... Uh, in the early and no, no, 20, 30 years ago, the, the the record was almost the end result, and the record was what bands were hoping to make their money from, and was mm. a significant profit stream, um, income stream. Spotify isn't; it just can't be, can it? So, so are we now thinking that Spotify is uh, a kind of a gateway to maybe touring or to merchandise or something, and it's more about in, in terms of income streams. The, the the business portion of that is still absolutely the same in the sense that Spotify is a radio station. Radio used to pay, you know, a bit of money, but no one got rich just off the radio for the most part. There were some people who just radio, but radio typically trans translated to physical sales. Okay, so no one buys anything physically, but they still buy merch and they still buy concert tickets. If you can break through to that next level, which is there is a disconnect between people who hit play on Spotify and listen to three hours of music during the day who don't actually know the names of any of the music that they're listening to and that go online, buy a ticket, get in your car, pay six fifty for gas and go to a show on that Tuesday night that you can, no one can convince anybody to go to. If you can make it through all of those hoops, there is a, an incredible living to be made because 
economy of scale, it costs you 25 or 50 cents to make a t-shirt and you sell them for $30. Right. You know, if you can get somebody to your show and get them to buy your merchandise and pay your, for your overpriced tickets, um, you know, you can make a living. It's, it's the people in the middle who really get squeezed because those of us on the bottom, like we're not fucking making anything no matter what. So whatever, we do it because we love it. It's the people who want to make a living out of this where they don't want to, um, they want it to have it be their job and not like, oh, this is what I do on the weekends. Those are the people who are having a really tough time because people are putting their financial resources into big ticket shows. It's kind of like if every movie was, you know, an Avengers movie and there's no art house, there's no just like, that was a good film, you know, not a, a $250 million blockbuster. Um, the, the middlemen are kind of getting squeezed at, from a musician standpoint. And there's a lot of good music. You need the opportunity to fall in love with the band and watch them across their journey of a few records. You know, it's rare that somebody comes out the gate with something that's mind blowing, but it, it can be disheartening because if you don't, you know, it's like, okay, well, how many times can I, can I continue to do this? Because there's no record company who's willing to keep writing those checks so that I can actually focus on this full time. Mm. So there's a fair amount of pressure, I think, put on people to, to make it happen. And then it has to happen in, in different ways. It has to happen on platforms like TikTok, or did you get a, uh, some sort of association with a lifestyle brand who's willing to push you and your music out in front of an audience that wouldn't typically see it? You know, um, music's music. The way you sell it's just changed a little bit. Yeah, man. Um, well, it just made me think about, I heard a story when Eucharist was signed, it was for a number of albums, but it was, I can't remember, but it was a, quite a few albums. I guess it, that doesn't exist anymore, does it? Not really. Um, the, the business has changed in the sense that I find myself doing a lot of this, what it used to be versus what it is now, but on a certain level, what this is, is really, it's run by economics. Um, you would sign previously an artist who you believed in, and you would amortize this out over the course of several records. You wouldn't, ex you would love a hit off of, you know, on, on the first record, but what you really needed to do was by record two or three, you needed to have made enough progress that this was going to work. And so talent scouts and our people would go and find these, these groups. And sometimes they would try and look for a diamond in the rough and say that, you know what, five years from now, this is going to be a thing. Um, now people in, in music don't know if they're going to have a job five minutes from now. So this concept that like you've built a career around being able to spot talent early on, that's not the risk reward isn't there for these conglomerates that now, you know, have to answer to shareholders. So what they want you to do now is to have basically done all the hard work yourself, be a success. And then they're, they're like a venture capital firm. Like, oh, you've already brought the product to market. You need me to basically just get you over that next hump. I'll put some resources into that. Mm -hmm. um, whereas before it was, you've got an idea, I like your idea. Let's see how your idea turns out in a year. I'm going to give you some money to keep working on your idea. That that's few and far between. Um, and it's, it is just the nature of the business because it is run from, you know, on a certain level, it's accountants, people who are looking at it like, well, if we're a company with X amount of dollars, we can invest it in music or we can invest it in something else that's going to pay this rate of return. So where is the smarter move? And music was, we're going to sign 10 bands, nine are going to fail, but that one that succeeds will have paid for all the failures and then some. Now it's, we're only going to sign one band and it better make sense because the money we would have spent on the other nine, we will invest in something else because we don't just do music as a corporation. We do film, we do television, we do production deals with artists who want to have branded water and shit like that. So the focus is, is not on music. Music is a means to an end. And I know this is me going off on a tangent about 
this, but I, it's what I've, it's what I've seen about the music business. It's got nothing to do with music. It's about the business, mm. you know? And if, if music could go away and they could figure out a way to sell you, Oh, I don't know. Beats headphones. They're, they're content on that. Yeah. The, the profit margin is a hell of a lot better than it is in dealing with fragile fucking egos of people who may never write another good song. <laughs> I sound angry. <laughs> I, think you're, I think you're right to be angry. Yeah, that yeah, sounds amazing. Fine, fine. <laughs> I was just going to, quick question about um, ticket prices in the States. Um, are they, is Ticketmaster like the conglomerate over there as it is in the UK? We've, for instance, we've got the Chili Peppers coming over here because they're releasing a new album on April the 1st. And I've, I've for, for one, physically can't afford to take my family to go and see them, even in the cheap seats, because we're talking £300 for two tickets. Ooh. And um, that's a substantial amount of money. And I'm sure a band like the Chili's, who came from where they came from, do they know that they're charging that? So it's not them charging that. It's, no. the, it's the ticket master. It's all the... You can pay an extra £40 to get in let a bit early to, go, to get down the front. Things like this. I'm just... Is it the same I, in the look, States? Yeah. I, I was on a flight the other day. My flight got canceled at, at five in the morning, so I had to switch airlines in order to get back home. And, and the airline I switched to will allow you to, because they do an open boarding process, no one has assigned seats, uh, will allow you to pay $50 to get to essentially a better boarding position, yeah. which means you can put your overhead bag in and stuff like that. So I spent the money. There is, you just got to follow the money on all of this. The band has a commodity to sell and it's just economics. Like my time is worth X amount of money vis-a-vis what somebody's willing to pay me to bring me into the room and essentially buy my time as an artist. And then everybody else gets their piece and they will do whatever they can do to test the market and reach that point of pain where you say, I'm not going. But they don't care if you go because as long as somebody else is willing to go, exactly. Exactly. Mm, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's that. Now, it's what do the bands know? The bands, I mean, look, the bands know all this shit. And everybody pays lip service to, oh, ticket prices, ticket prices. It's like, yeah, you, but you're not cutting your ticket prices. Because also, because even if you did, people still have their hands in the pot. You know, Pearl Jam tried to try and do some something about it. Um, but the market has just been cornered by a handful of, of um companies who have also consolidated and pushed out independent promoters. There are very few independent promoters around the country. There are venues who are affiliated with the conglomerates and the economics of touring are, are such that, you know, you're competing. It's, it's three different companies that are competing with one another and they don't really give a shit what you, what you pay for your ticket. Cause where they get you is your parking the beer concessions, the piece of the merchandise they take is the house. Yeah. So it's all a racket. Um, I don't think that the chili peppers are necessarily any greedier than anybody else. It's if they're, they're going to get off the couch, they're going to take what they're going to take, but then everybody else wants their piece of it too. Cause yeah, you know, exactly. bringing a show in like that chili pepper show, that's a big production. Yeah. And I don't just mean like how many trucks show up to put on the show. It's just the organization of, of getting that big of a thing. You know, it's, you can still go to the, you know, the local pub and see music if you want to. It's probably a bit more expensive than it used to be, but you know, it's supply and demand. Yeah. Yeah. It's the shame. It would be nice, but, but alternatively, alternatively, you know, some of these places will argue, well, well, just watch the live stream. It's more, it's more cost effective. <laughs> I don't know that it's really the way that I want to watch the show, but yeah. it is an option. How much is that latest tool vinyl? 900 pounds, 800 pounds? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. Yeah. The, tour, the tour edition five disc set. Five are, 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 are 900 pounds because it's, it's a limited edition. So it's a scarcity. That's what it is. Like tickets, I guess, isn't it? The fans are outraged. <laughs> And yet they keep showing up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. That's the other side of the coin, isn't it? Yeah. I'm just keen to hear more about East of June. I'm just um, <laughs> a recent find of mine. 
when are you coming to England? Yes, that's a, that's a big one. <laughs> right. That would, uh, trust me, you guys would be the first to know. Um, no plans to come to England as of yet. Uh, new music is in the works, but what we're going to be doing is um, we put out on YouTube uh, five or six songs that we had done live at East West Studios and, and shot a nice version of and then we've got another five songs that are coming out in a similar sort of format so there's they're all live um but it's songs that we didn't do on the on the last run so that's going to be the the next round of things before new music um i'll, I'll try and get you guys some stuff here sooner rather than later they're they're finishing editing some videos so we'll get that together soon. that's exciting super um, uh, yeah and when you come here we'll be there We'll be there. Whether it's a Tuesday hey, or not, you know, we'll be there. With, with the 900 pound uh, ticket price, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, thank you very much yeah, for coming on the so podcast. Much. It's been an absolute pleasure to It's my to spend absolute some time pleasure, with you. gentlemen. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It was fun, it was fun catching up with you guys. And ho- hopefully, we'll speak to you soon. Absolutely. Take, Take care, care, guys. See you uh, Bye. Bye. See, that was good, wasn't it? How bloody amazing was that? Yeah, that was really good. I was um I was a pri- I was a privilege and a pleasure to speak to him. I can't believe it happened. Uh, do we need to? M- can we mention Water Bear? Yes, because that's how it's kind of happened, isn't it? Yeah, please, yeah, please do. Your hard work through Water Bear. So yeah, so I um first met Dirk online. I've never met him in real life. That pleasure is coming soon, hopefully. But um, been in the same room as him at venues and gigs. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so I mean, I last saw I love, I was in the same room with him at Brixton Academy, which yeah. Was, yeah. An amazing gig, but um, I had a mu- I had the pleasure of conducting a masterclass with Dirk for all our bass students at Water Bear, and he was just I mean, he, you saw how informative, engaging, witty, funny he was that like that. And the student, students just fell in love with him. They've been talking about that was over a year ago. Shit, that was over a year ago. That's amazing. Yeah, uh, yeah, and they just and they, they still talk about him since about yeah. how amazing it was. I had so many like geeky questions that I'd sort of refrain from. <laughs> <laughs> But that's good. But we, we gleaned some good information from the yeah. Dirk. Yeah, so. and um, that was quite, yeah, and getting to meet Dirk Lance is always, always a pleasure. Yeah, that's that. good. That's one. That's, that's another good. one ticked off the list for you. That's amazing. It? Next one, uh, let's play pool. I don't, yeah. know. <laughs> I don't know if you can drum up some. I don't know, is he on Twitter? Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, that's cool. All right, we've got to do an outro song because that's right. what we do. We're going to do a mashup, are we? Let's do it. All right, okay. Um, okay, here we go. <laughs> I was going to introduce it, but, I'm not, but I can't. I don't even know how it's going to work. Oh. My hair's a bit nicer. All right. There's a fire stalling in my heart. Reaching a fever pitch and it's bringing me out the dark Finally I can see you crystal clear Go ahead and sell me out and I'll lay your ship bare That doesn't rhyme See how I live with every piece of you Cause we could have had it all <laughs> Rolling in the deep You had my heart inside of your hands And you played it to the beat See, Adele oh, How long can we keep this going for? <laughs> I don't know any more words <laughs> You've got them in front of you No, I'm not reading them <laughs> Oh, that was from memory, was it? That was from memory <laughs> Memory <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks so much. Until next time. Say goodbye. Bye. Say goodbye.